You know, back when I was a kid, I saw ads and artwork for Parasite Eve 2 all over the place. Square were doing pretty good for themselves at the time, so I can imagine that their marketing budget would have been higher than it is now. So back then, they promoted the crap out of Final Fantasy VIII and Parasite Eve 2. Hell, I even remember seeing Final Fantasy VIII on the news at the time, because it used some new advanced graphics thing that blew people's minds and shit. Still, despite all of that, I never actually played Parasite Eve 2 until now. Not because of a lack of trying, mind you, but for some reason the game is pretty much non-existent over here. So yeah, with my still active, prepubescent hype for all things square hard, I was pretty excited to play this game. I mean, the first Parasite Eve was pretty fucking great for its time, and seeing as this game spans a whopping TWO DISCS. It must be fucking amazing. I mean, it, it is, right? Guys, please. Anyway, the story is set several years after the events of the first game. Aya isn't a regular cop anymore. Now, she's part of the FBI's mitochondrial investigation and suppression team, aka MIST. And there just so happens to be a mitochondrial outbreak going on, which serves as a great excuse to start shooting stuff. And that's basically it. There isn't really any kind of villain or actual motivation, and none of the characters from the first game return either. I mean, the outbreak is obviously caused by someone or something, but there's no mystery to any of it. Not to mention the fact that there isn't any character development at all. Or really any characters to begin with, actually. Even Aya is just kind of a soulless golem for most of the game, and the plot is just surprisingly non-existent, especially when compared to how story-driven the first game was. However, the game is still incredibly cinematic despite the lack of an actual story. As bizarre as that may sound. I mean, the cutscenes are filled with tons of great cinematography, which is pretty strange considering that it's a game with pre-rendered backgrounds, and if anything, it definitely shows where all the budget went. I mean, they filled the game with Coca-Cola ads, so one can only assume that they spend a lot of money on this motherfucker. Anyway, the game handles story in kind of a weird way. Like I said, it's still very cinematic, there's lots of dialogue as well, and for what it is, it's definitely enjoyable in a B-movie kind of way. But there just isn't enough story there to support any of it. I mean, people do talk about shit, obviously, but all of it just feels like filler. Really, it's more like it's the promise of a story rather than an actual story. It's really bizarre and I can't say I've ever seen anything quite like it. Anyway, gameplay-wise, it's a complete departure from the first game. Instead of combining survival horror with a JRPG and taking the best of both worlds, it combines elements from the horribly dated action games of the time with probably the worst qualities of survival horror. So what you end up with is a repetitive third-person shooter with really unresponsive controls and somewhat out-of-place RPG elements. Things like the cramp hallways, static camera angles and tank controls work great for horror, but not so much for something Wikipedia calls an action role-playing survival horror video game. Which roughly translates to a game where you shoot things with some tense music in the background. It's not at all like Silent Hill or Resident Evil, where you have a limited amount of ammo, so you're usually encouraged to run rather than fight. No. In P2, you're constantly forced to kill shit over and over. Which wouldn't have been all that bad if they'd kept the battle system somewhat similar to the first game, only slightly faster paced. But instead, they went for a more traditional survival horror style of combat. So there's tank controls. Very slow and unresponsive tank controls. 
Now, as I've said many times before, I really don't mind tank controls at all given that they work in the game's favor. You know, like the way they create tension in Resident Evil, or how they make you manage your time better in Hogs of War. But in this game they quickly become a hindrance more than anything. Thing is, the tank controls are slow and unresponsive, because every time the camera shifts to another location, the game stops for a fraction of a second. So it's kinda like playing a game with a very low frame rate. This makes running fast and dodging enemies really hard to do. I feel like they kinda knew the controls sucked though, so they added a lock-on system. Now this would have been a pretty good idea if, you know, it actually worked. Thing is, even while you're locked on, Aya still slowly turns to her target. And because of that, a lot of your bullets end up in the wall cause she's spinning around like a fucking gun turret. Which is especially annoying since most enemies move really fast and usually end up close to her feet as well. Now, most of this would have been okay if you were able to dodge enemies and oncoming attacks. But like I already said, that's really hard to do because of the tank controls and camera transitions. And they clearly wanted you to dodge as well, since a lot of enemies telegraph their attacks beforehand. But Aya's just too damn slow to dodge effectively. Now, I do realize that most of this may very well be done on purpose. But that doesn't make it any less frustrating. Anyway, despite the game claiming to be about survival, there's no shortage of ammo and items whatsoever. Sure, Aya can only carry so much, but tons of areas have inexhaustible ammo boxes. And since the game is built in kind of a metroidvania-like fashion in terms of exploration, you can go back to any of those areas at any time. Now, considering the amount of shooting, this is a good thing. But it also takes away any sense of urgency the game could have had, and if anything, it only demonstrates how incredibly visionless the game is. I mean, it seems to me like they wanted to create a straight up Resident Evil clone, but that during development, the game just got more and more action packed as it went on. And instead of starting over from scratch with their new vision, they continued to build on the foundation set by Resident Evil. So because of that, the game feels very schizophrenic to say the least. And the strangest thing is, the game doesn't even start out all that bad. Thing is, the game is literally split up into two. The entirety of disc 1 is actually pretty good. The music is awesome, the menus look nice, there's lots of cool cinematography, the animations are done better than in any other PS1 game I've seen so far, and you can even see Aya's reflection in the floor tiles and windows, which is also pretty cool. Overall, it just gives off a very well-made impression. And hell, even the combat is fine when used sparingly enough which it is for the first few hours. But at the start of disc 2, the game kinda shits itself and it becomes nothing more than grinding and backtracking with little to no story at all. And I mean, the areas look good and they have some pretty tense atmosphere, but that doesn't make the gameplay any less tedious. Especially when you keep dying over and over. In fact, I think I died more in this game than in any of the Silent Hills and Resident Evils combined. It's incredibly frustrating. Not only because it's usually because of the controls and the no fault of your own, but also because dying sets you back to the title screen every time. Now, as I was suffering through the game's second disc, I came to a shocking conclusion. And that's that all of this is just because of someone going a little nuts with the enemy placement. I mean, if the game had less enemies, the backtracking and controls wouldn't have been such big annoyances because you wouldn't have to dodge and shoot all the time. And I even think the game would have been scarier as a result, since every encounter would have a lot more impact. So pretty much all issues the game has, apart from the somewhat lackluster story, wouldn't have been there if they just hadn't turned the encounter dial all the way up to 11. In some ways, I think that this is an easy mistake to make as a company mostly responsible for JRPGs. But sadly, something as seemingly harmless as overzealous enemy placement completely ruined the overall experience for me. Anyway, after this game came out, it pretty much seemed like the Parasite Eve series had died along with the fifth console generation. But then, in the post-apocalyptic future of 2011, Square Enix decided to release a new game in the Parasite Eve series. And it's called The Third Birthday. So yeah, 
Join me next time as we take on this classic for the Sony PSP. Yay!